Awesome. Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, today is Wednesday, April 29th, in case anybody else needs a reminder of where, what day it is, what day in time. Uh, on behalf of Primary Stages and the ESPA family, I welcome all of our returning folks and our new folks uh, to today's Lunch and Learn Playwriting Prompt. Uh, we are so excited today to have Rogelio Martinez with us. He is an ESPA faculty member, and I'm so excited to get to chat with you today, Rogelio. Hi. I'm excited to be here. I had so many uh, other appointments, but I made room for this one. I mean, uh, there's like so much to do, um, but I'm psyched to be here, yeah. Rogelio is an award-winning playwright. Uh, his plays have been workshopped and produced in theaters across the country and the world. He just returned from Germany, uh, where a workshop of his play, Born in East Berlin, was performed at the Stasi Museum in Berlin, in both English and German, and the play had its world premiere at the San Francisco Playhouse in February, which was so recent. He's also a 2017 Guggenheim Fellow uh, recipient. He is a recipient of the Princess Grace Award and a mid-career fellowship at the Lark Theatre Company. Some of his plays include When Tang Met Laika, uh, his Cold War trilogy, which includes Ping Pong, Born in East Berlin, Blind Date, and he's been workshopped and commissioned by various theaters ac across the country, including the Public, uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the Mark Taper Forum, South Coast Rep. The list goes on and on. His website's really nice. It's visually, very visually appealing, Rogelio. I was on oh, it uh, earlier this week. And yeah, check out his website. It looks really cool. Uh, just a reminder, today's uh, Lunch and Learn works like this. For the first hour, Rogelio is with us. Uh, thank you for sending in your questions ahead of time. He will, will be answering those. And if you have a question throughout, you can send me a chat uh, privately and uh, we'll filter those in as we move along. So for about the first half hour, we'll do those questions and then we'll dive into the writing prompt, which Rogelio has prepared for us today. So thank you, Rogelio. Thank you. Thank you for uh, yeah. sharing your schedule. <laughs> we are... <laughs> So grateful to have you here. Um, I thought those questions that people wrote in and I shared with you were really great. Yeah. And I want to start with, who are your playwriting literary influences and mentors? You know, that's, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip to mentors and then I'll yeah. double back. But I think uh, right uh, as I was leaving grad school, I met Eduardo Machado and um, I became his assistant for like about two years. I was his assistant. And he had studied with Irene Fornes. And um, so he taught me a lot about uh, writing exercises. He taught me a lot about teaching, but, um, but he was prolific and he wasn't precious with his work. I remember um, he wrote has written like 60 plays and I just had a conversation with him the other day. He's like, I, I don't know what half of them are. Um, and I remember one of my favorite plays of his, he had only written 10 pages. It was a, it was a wonderful play and the computer crashed. We never got it back. And, uh, and I'm always after him to write it, but it just, you know, but the thing that Eduardo taught me beyond just how to give notes, how to take notes, how to receive notes, how to write, it's just like, it, it's just getting it done and always thinking forward, always thinking about the next project. Um, and, and moving on and, um, and, and, and just be ambitious. And, and, and he never mentioned like the play won't be produced because it's this or that, it, that was never part of the conversation. So, so that was really, that was really great. Um, as far as literary influences, I mean, it, 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 I think it depends on the play that I'm working on. Um, partly because my, my first instinct is I'm working on a play I'll look at my bookshelf and I'll say, who, who wrote this play before? So I can, so they can teach me how to write it. Um, so it all depends on whose work. I mean, if, but, if, but if I had to be pinned down, like I would say, I, I, I would say like, who am I most interested in, in meeting? Who am I most interested? Whose work am I most interested in? I, I love Carol Churchill, uh, simply because her plays are always different. They're always unpredictable. They're getting shorter and shorter. Um, so she's becoming very, very precise with her language. I asked one person who knew her why her plays were getting shorter. And she said, well, she has grandchildren and she likes to spend time with her grandchildren. And I think there's truth to that. And I think there's also truth to the fact that 
she's she's like she's become this incredible surgeon. I mean, you look at her early plays from the seventies; they're extremely wordy. Um, but then you look now. So I, I love her work. I love David Henry Wan's work. Very few plays sort of bring me bring me to tears. And Yellow Face was was one of those. Uh, Paula Vogel is just another amazing writer. I can't. Um, but you know, these are writers who like emotionally affect me, uh, which is which is hard because I'm always watching a play and I'm watching it technically. I'm not. Uh, so when something catches up to you, like when when I saw Indecent and it caught up to me at the very end, I was like, wow. And then the same thing with um, with Yellow Face at the very end. Um, and even uh, David's play Soft Power at the very end, it caught me. I was like, whoa, what, how did how did you do that? How did you make me lead, you know, put my guard down, like my brain down so that I could be swept emotionally. So, you know, those are writers. I, I like Tom Stoppard as well a lot. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good, good list. I think that's a robust list, a great yeah. reading list perhaps as well. Uh, I love this idea that your mentor uh, taught you how to just get the thing done. Uh, what were the, was the phrase you used? I'm misquoting you. I, th I think it's just, it was always be moving forward. Always be moving always forward. Always moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, always be moving forward. Which, uh, one of the questions we've received was about the proverbial writer's block. Right. Um, somebody wrote in and said they've reverted to rewriting. How right. do you reignite inspiration to continue to move forward? Um, yeah, well, I have like two answers for that. Uh, uh, it, it, Eduardo always said to just have uh, like, so, so for example, you're writing characters and you're having a scene and you suddenly hit this block. Just have the other character, it, it's like jump starting a car. Have the other character say, why are you not speaking now? And then the other character will have to respond to that, right? And if they don't respond, you keep at it. You're like, you see, this is what happens. You, you go, you don't say a word whenever there's any conflict. And that's what I hate about you. So why don't you speak up? And suddenly you're going to see that you're going to start to like get yourself out of it. And before you know it, you're out of writer's block. You're moving forward. You can always go back, trim that dialogue. I guarantee you that a lot of that dialogue will stay because it's so raw, so vivid, so like unexpected. But it's just like really, really like get angry at the character um, and see how they, they respond. Um, and then, so that's sort of like the more visceral way of getting out of writer's block. And then the other way is just simply uh, to go, it, writer's block means that you made, a, you made a wrong turn somewhere. And so back, start to slow, don't go rewriting because I, I, always, say, I always say this, the most seductive thing for a writer is a blank page, right? It, there's so, it's so seductive. It's so beautiful, right? Because anything can happen. You can write scene one and you got yourself a Pulitzer. And that's the temptation of rewriting, which is like, you know what? I'm stuck. I have writer's block. I'm going to go back to scene one and just start working my way through it. You're still going to hit writer's block because something went wrong and it wasn't in scene one and it wasn't in scene two. At some point you made a wrong turn. And so it's about just backing up slowly and seeing where that wrong turn was made. Um, and, but it's certainly not about going back to page one. Um, that's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. Because it's, it's fun. You know, you create a new file. How exciting is that? Then, you know, you feel like you're doing something. Oh, I'm going to, so how should I format it? What, you know, but, but, but you're trying to create action in your life, which is great, you know, but there are other ways of doing that as well. So, or then you just, or, or simply block, walk away from it. Go to, you know, I can't say go to the store or, drive a car, but it's that, or, you know, try to, try to find something that has movement. Like riding a train is great because there's movement. And so that sort of starts to get you out of writer's block as well. Um, so, yeah. I love that, finding something with movement. I always find I'm inspired to write on trains. I don't know why. Yeah, um, trains are great, yeah. <laughs> now I think I have a little window into that. Uh, yeah. On the other side of writer's block, could you talk about solutions you use for when you have so many ideas plot-wise and you don't know which is that hottest choice? Yeah. Yeah, plot, you know, 
plot is born in, in, in playwriting specifically, is that's what we're talking about. Plot is born out of character. So uh, there are a couple of things. One is not, not think too much. Um, I always say that you wake up with these amazing ideas, amazing solution to a problem, and you're like, wow. And then you sit down and within two minutes, you know it's the wrong choice. So try it, like do it. It's, it's, it you will know if it's the wrong choice right away. Um, and, and so, but is it the, go back and, and, and really sort of investigate your character. That's one of the, that's the exercise we're going to be doing today is a lot about character because it all starts with character. And so the, this, the, which, what road to choose? Well, it, there shouldn't be a choice. The character is making those choices and the character is moving forward with those choices. So I think it's, 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 it's a test it. And if you're still not sure, B, go back to the character. Who is this character and why, what, 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 what's, what's going on with this character? I think that's where it lies. So, yeah. So the, the, let the character drive the plot decisions. Yeah, always let, you always let the character drive yeah. the plot. You know, that, the, you always let the character drive the plot. I mean, I think, I, I remember there was a book, um, it was a playwriting book. Maybe it was it was David Ball. There's a book by David Ball called Backwards and Forwards. Backwards and Forwards. <laughs> yeah, which I think is like the best playwriting book out there. I, I think it's the only one that's really you should read. Um, but I think I think in it, it, and maybe I'm wrong. He says um, if if you'd written the line "Who's there," you could write Hamlet because it's such a you know. And, and, and that's, that's, a, that's things that you like learn and steal, which is like, ask a question, you know. Um, I think it, there's another play, there's another book, maybe it's David Ball's book, maybe, but they're talking about my, Mark Ravenhill's, uh, Ravenhill's play, uh, Shopping and Fucking, which starts with someone knocking at the door. And, th and, and they make a, you know, just the act of opening the door is a big event, but it's character driven and not plot driven, so. Yeah. Now, when writing a piece that uh, pulls in research as well, yeah. uh, how, how do you integrate character and the research and the writing process uh, like on a piece when Tang met Laika? Well, with Tang met Laika was a little bit uh, different than my, my other plays because with that, I had the, you know, I, Jose Rivera wrote this wonderful list of of things about a playwriting. And one of them said, you know, write impossible stage directions. And, and uh, I, I, I remember writing like, I said, okay, so the space shuttle or something is docking into the space station or something. And so the, 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 the moment came very quickly to me. And then the first scene came very quickly to me. Um, and the, fir the first 10 pages wrote themselves in like, you know, maybe uh, two hours. And it was like the rest of the play that took me two years. Uh, and the, the thing was that I didn't know what it was that I wanted to write about, but the writing came very quickly. And so when I went back, I, I needed to know what I was talking about in order to gain the audience's trust, which is really something that you, you need to do when you're writing plays that are loosely based or, you, you, you know, you, you need to like, prove that you know what you're talking about within the first five minutes of the play. Um, that's why, uh, so, so I, I had to go back and do the research, but by then I had, by, the, by that time, I had lost what, what it was that I wanted to say with the play. And there are things that I'm very satisfied with in the play, and then there are things I, I, I really don't like about that particular play that, that can't be fixed, I, and I wish I could fix them. I think it was John Patrick Shanley who said that you can't rewrite a play after seven years because your body has gone through an incredible transformation. Physically, you are a new person. And so it's very hard to rewrite a play after seven years. And Tanwin went like I had sort of done that expiration date. And every so often I look at it and I'm like, you know, I, 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 the other day, uh, my daughter spawned a published version and, and I opened it and I said, you know, this is, this is a good start. This is a good beginning, but I know the problem is later. So I just stopped at the first page and I was like, the problem's not on this page. 
it's later. Um, but as far as like doing research, like on my other plays, like specifically when I was writing about Reagan and Gorbachev and Schultz, you do, you know, you spend about a year and a half doing research and then you put it all away and, and, and you know these people so intimately that even, even if what they're saying is not true, it is true. Um, and you also, uh, you also, re you'll have selective memory. You'll remember the things that matter the most. Um, and that's, but, but I do a lot of research. So what I learned with Muntam and Laika was, you know, come up with some kind of idea. Don't make too many choices. Dive into the research and your instincts will carry you to the play. I, I, that's not what happened with Tam with Metlika. That's what happened with every other play since then. Um, so I, I understood the mistake I made. I just couldn't fix it. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I had to unmute myself there. Uh, let's see. Going back to our list of questions. How did the international workshop of Born in East Berlin compare to its domestic world premiere? What oh. theatrical lessons from ab abroad can sure. we apply here? Well, one of the, so, so we did a workshop of it a couple of years ago, actually, in Romania. Uh, no, yeah, Romania. And, um, and I forget what the, where the place was, but it was uh, a university. And it was published in Romanian, actually. Um, but it was this university and there were, uh, uh, it was Hungarians and Romanians and they both went to this university and they didn't get along. So like the Romanians did their own translation and the Hungarians did their own translation and they workshopped the plays. And, um, and uh, I was there, Rajiv was there workshopping his play, described the night. So we were both there and, and I didn't speak Romanian or Hungarian. So I was forced to do something which is like something that we writers must force, which is to listen. Like I wasn't listening with a pen to cut lines. I was just watching the stage. And, and, and like I, had, I can't fix it because I'm only hearing it in a foreign language. So all I'm doing is like feeling like just the rhythms of the play. And I did a rewrite when I came back from Romania. And after that, the play was pretty locked. Um, it went, it, it got workshopped uh, at Theater Works, but, and then, and then the, we did a bunch of rewriting for the world premiere, but it didn't change, the changes that were made were made post Romania, post the fact that I couldn't understand what they were saying. Um, and then we did a workshop at the Stasi Museum in Berlin, which was really, really kind of unsettling because uh, we used Building 22 in the Stasi Museum, and Building 22 is the cafeteria building. This is where like they, they so this is where they ate, and it's like really kind of just it, it just gives you the chills that so many people's lives were talked about in this room, and um, and 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 but what also made it unsettling is that I speak I, I speak hardly no German, and um, and I mean, this German audience, I don't, I can't speak in general. Uh, I build laughs into a play very early on. Like I, I, I know that you've got to get a laugh within five minutes because uh, laughter unifies. So people come to the theater and they no, nobody knows one another. And, um, and you have to put a laugh so that they become one person. And then, and then you're in control. And then they break apart. Like, then you can see when they, when they break apart with ten, when Tam and Laika, they were with me and 10 minutes into it. This is a good, this is a good story. When Tam and Laika, this is what, this is what bad rewriting is, but not, okay. So when Tam and Laika were 10 minutes into the play and this audience is with it. And then suddenly the guy's home and he's having this sort of melancholia. He's having problems with like, how does he deal with his wife and two kids? when he's experienced something she can't she has not experienced and he's sort of he's fallen in love with this other woman and the audience immediately like the moment that they sense he had fallen in love they like they like pushed back and he said you're a bad person basically so we said in previews i said let's let's cut one of the kids 
let's just cut one of the kids. They'll forgive us if we cut one of the kids. And then further into previews, they're like, let's just kill both kids. There are no kids. There are no consequences. And of course, we couldn't get rid of the wife because the wife was essential to the conflict. But, um, but we got rid of two kids and it didn't work. That, there was a bigger problem. But laughter does unify an audience. But in Germany, uh, they didn't laugh. They didn't laugh at all. And it was like very unsettling. And then at the end of the first act, I thought, um, I thought, oh, you know, at least a quarter of them will leave. And then nobody left. So then I thought, okay, well, maybe it's customary to not leave, you know, even if like you are hating it. And then they like, they gave it so much love at the end. They, they gave it the, the most clapping that I've ever gotten on a play. And, and they, they, it's like they reserved all the emotion and they gave it at the end of the play, which was really kind of, uh, it was a very different experience because it, I had no way of gauging whether something was working or not. Um, so, yeah. So e each country, you know, each, each experience was slightly different, but, uh, but killing children will not help your rewriting. That there is a bigger problem. Do not, you know, that is not the problem. So I remember we took fewer, we took more and more toys away from the stage you know, and uh, it still didn't work, so, yeah. So keep the children in your writing. <laughs> keep the children, there's a bigger problem. You know. <laughs> there's a bigger problem than the yeah. kids. Uh, yeah. We have a message here from Ari, she wrote in, she was wondering why you went into writing. Why I went into writing? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, like, and this is like a, a crazy story, but the first play I saw was Speed the Plow, and I knew, I knew very little about uh, uh, playwriting. I knew like back backstage stuff because I was um, I was always working backstage for like the passion play, you know, like every Easter because uh, they paid well. Like they, you know, for a high school kid, they paid well. Um, and um, but then I went to see Speed the Plow because Madonna was in it, and this is why I have no problem casting bad actors or famous people. I have no problem because it brings other people to the theater that normally would not go. And that's okay. So it's a disaster, so what, you know? Um, Joe, Ron Silver was in it and Joe Mantegna were in it. And they're like, they were like amazing actors. And that's what I remember. And I remember like, I remember the spit I, that was coming out of these two guys. And I remember the language. And I remember just how visceral it was. And I thought, I thought, wow, I wanna do that. I wanna be able to, to like fight with words. And then I went to college and then I was like, I was, uh, I, I, I studied uh, journalism, filmmaking, um, but I was really in, into journalism. And then I just, I, I think my internships were like in, in theater in the summer. So I didn't know what to do. And I really liked college. I've always liked like college. I don't want to leave it. So I just applied to grad school because I didn't want to leave college. And then and I applied for playwriting because that's what I knew most. Um, so it just sort of, it was just like I, out of the fact that I just did not want to leave campus. They just have, they have to drag me out. Uh, a pandemic, okay? So, we're, cause we're not on campus now. I apologize, I'm not trying to make light of it, but it, it did get me out of campus. I think theater is the perfect profession for uh, lifelong students. That's what I describe myself yeah. as. Every yeah. new show is like a new class. It's like a new course. Well, and I mean, I think it's the, it's the same thing with like, um, with, uh, which is why I enjoy teaching. And, I, you know, because they, they give me these, these plays, I assign these plays and they, they give me a paper on it. And somebody was very nuanced, like very detailed. And I, 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 I assigned two, two drafts of uh, Rajiv's play, Guards of the Taj, a very early draft and a later in the published draft. And in one draft, for some reason, he has the guards facing east and in another one, he has the guards facing south. I suspect Rajiv just, there's no rhyme or reason, but the student pointed it out. And I thought, wow, that is a careful reading. I know this play inside and out, you know, but, but they come to me with, other ideas that I never saw in the play. And it's always like you're experiencing these plays that you fell in love with over and over again, because you're seeing it through their eyes and through their discoveries. So, um, 
so 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 I I I love teaching. It's 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 you know I I don't know what I would do without it. Well, we're so glad that you yeah. you teach with us and you're teaching yeah. us right now. Yeah. Um, I have uh, one more uh, question here that was sent in uh, from Jane, and she wants to know how much of your personal history do you bring to your place, your point of view, your politics? Uh, and she is actually mentioning a blind date in particular. Right. So, um, I mean, so the the politics i mean you have to fall in love with all your characters so right you know you can't you, you just got to fall in love with them and you got to give them a break do i agree with reagan's politics probably not i'm not i'm not going to be so introspective do i agree with that moment in history do i agree the fact that he was the first president uh to reach out uh, to gorbachev but gorbachev did not reach out to him he wrote him a letter uh, so this was a person acting outside of his personality, um, outside of the box. He understood something was changing. So that's, that was interesting to me. But what, what was more interesting to me in that play was uh, Schultz, because Schultz was uh, a dove in, a, in a, a cabinet of hawks. And so he tried to resign twice, and Reagan did not let him. And, uh, and so I was really, really interested in this. Very, this outlier in this in this in this administration. Um, so how do my politics align with that? Is 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 the question? And I don't. I mean, I, I I'm an extremely private person as far as my 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 life. As far as like, so I think that it's it's what's on stage. I I, I everybody everybody gets a fair break. If I'm going to write about them. They're going to get a fair break. They're going to get a, they're, they're going to get their chance, and I'm going to pick the moment where I believe they should get their chance. I'm not writing. I don't write biopics. I don't. I I, I zero in a very specific moment. Um, you know, I I I um, I wrote about Nixon, and that was that was sort of an interesting experience. And so, how do you write about Nixon? Um, you know, I mean, if you just listen to the Nixon tapes, he's a nasty, nasty man. So, how do you write about him? Well, you know, it was self-destructive. And one of the things I found really interesting is that when Nixon went to China, this was a highlight. This was a highlight of his presidency. But his character would not, was so, he was so spiteful that he would not allow, um, he only allowed three, three news agencies to go and not the New York Times. So he was like very, so he was so self-destructive. So to me, it's interesting to write about uh, it's Shakespearean, like you are achieving the greatness and your character is destroying you at the same time. And, 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 and so that to me is so fascinating. He like achieved such greatness and destroyed himself at the same time. Um, and so how do I feel about Nixon? I mean, I, you know, it, I feel the same way that, uh, I forget who wrote, uh, Frost Nixon, um, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, Peter Morgan um, felt about Nixon. You know, you see it on there. It's it's a person who can't. I always teach that play. I love Frost Nixon. How many of us know it? Anybody nod? Yes. I teach that play, and I say that play is really three scenes, and the scenes are only one minute long, and they all have to do with shoes. They all have to do with shoes. In the first scene, the 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 Nixon character says to his advisor, did you see those shoes he was wearing in Italian? And the guy says, I think they're very effeminate. And Nixon says, hmm, right? In the second scene, the scenes, the shoes are brought up. Um, the, uh, they're about to start the interview. And Nixon says, those shoes, are they Italian or, or something? And he goes, and, and Mark, you know, the, 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 uh, I forget the name of the, uh, the other character. He just died. Um, uh, he, he was, he's surprised. And, and then in the third scene, the guy brings him a pair of those shoes. Uh, that's the final scene of the play. Um, and Nixon uh, never opens the box, right? And so I know, I know someone who was on the set when they, when they shot the film. And, and they said they shot that, that ending 40 different ways. And the way that the film ends is that he's, he's, he has the box next to him. And, um, 
and he's looking out at the Pacific Ocean. But the box is next to him. He, he doesn't open it. They try with him trying on the shoes. They try this. And I said, ultimately, this is a man who can't get outside of his own box. That's what the play is about. He can't get those Italian loafers on. He can't. He wants to. He so desperately wants to. But that's Peter Morgan's interpretation, because I've actually seen the real interview. And Nixon did that to throw uh, whatever his name is. I'm, I'm forgetting his name. The, the Australian. Uh, uh, the, what is it? God, he had a show. Um, anyway, to throw him off his, off his game. He like literally said, where'd you get those shoes? And, and you literally see him react for a moment. And then 30 seconds later, they're taping. So Nixon did it. But Peter Morgan took that idea, that very real idea and said, huh, I'm not going to follow history. I know this woman very well. I'm not going to follow history. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually literally take Nixon at his word and say, he's curious about the shoes, which means he's curious about other ways people live. And he knows that he can't live those lives, but he's curious. And that's a sympathetic view of him. And that's why the play is great. Uh, so, yeah. They, I keep trying to think of the name of the, of the, of the, of the other guy who is, uh, um, if anybody ever sees the video for Hey Jude, uh, anybody ever see that 1968, uh, 69? Yeah, that's the guy. It's the same show. It's, it's, he's, he's the same guy who interviews Nixon six years later. It's for that show. So, um, cool. Yeah. Shall we, uh, dive into some yeah. writing prompts? Sure. So, um, I have this writing prompt that's actually based on I read many years ago a play called uh, Cigarettes and Chocolate. Does anybody know that play? It's an Anthony Minghella play. Um, I want to make sure it's Cigarettes and Chocolate and not Chocolate and Cigarettes. Yeah, it's Cigarettes and Chocolate. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonderful play. But I read that play years ago. And, and um, when, I, when I first read it, I thought that I, had, I, I, I came up with this exercise. And it's a very, very simple exercise. It begins with, I just want you to write down 10 text messages, right? They're not, uh, don't worry about who's sending them. Don't worry about who they're sending them to. I just want you to be as random as possible. You can use emojis. You can use, uh, you know, you could abbreviate words. Some of them could be like five lines long. Some can just be, you know, okay, right? Like it's just 10 text messages. Don't worry about who's writing them. Don't worry about who they're being sent to. Just be as random as possible. So, um, so that's like that's the first step, and that's like two minutes. So that should take you two minutes.
Okay, so now you have 10 text messages. So this is where, where like it gets a little tricky. So those 10 text messages, um, if you look at them, they have like sort of contradictions built into them sometimes, like if you sent them all to one person. Now, I want them all to be sent to one person, right? So now what you're doing is you're creating a character. So I just want you to write a narrative where you incorporate into that narrative all of these person, all of these details. And what I mean by a narrative is I just want you to do a character portrait. Like, so, so for example, if a text message says, I'm, I'm, I'm getting pizza tonight, right? You can make a bunch of choices, which is like the person is vegan, right? Or the person uh, is, is Catholic and it's Friday. So you're creating an outline of who this human being is just by those clues. It's like as if you found 10 clues somewhere that said, this is one person, can you put this puzzle together? And you can't, oftentimes things may contradict gender. There may be, you got to embrace the contradiction because that's going to give you the most unpredictable, wonderful character. Um, and it always works. So you just got to embrace any, any problem. So, um, so give that a try. Is that, is that clear? Just want to make sure it's clear. Cool. All right. Why don't we take uh, like 10 minutes or so? Is that good? Yeah, we'll take 10 minutes. Okay, cool.
All righty. Um, it, and I always think it's, it's great when you make this very hard for yourself when you do those 10 text messages, because now you are forced then to sort of reconcile it all and create a character. But you have a very, a character that's extremely alive that keeps, has secrets, uh, which is really important. Characters should have secrets. Not everybody knows certain things about them. Um, in Anthony Minghella's play, it all begins with, you know who they're leaving it to, um, but it all begins with a set of uh, uh, people leaving messages on, on an answering machine. And I always loved that. I thought, oh my God, I know so much about this person and I ha this person has not entered the stage yet. And that's sort of where I got the idea for the exercise. It's like, if I could, if I could do that, if I could take 10 text messages, I would know so much about the person, even though it would be so many different sources. And I would know if the person was different people to, you know, different to anybody. But um, anyway, uh, you know, I think that's, it all begins with character. That's, um, I often say this, which is that play, it's, it, you have to think of it as like a three year relationship at the least, you know, because it takes you, let's say it takes you a year to write it. Let's, let's be, let's be positive. It takes you a year to workshop it, let's be positive. And then in the third year, it gets produced. But that comes with its own set of workshops. So, uh, so when you commit to writing something, make sure it's something that you really want to write. Make sure it's something that three years down the line, and that's why I have so many plays that I begin that about two months in, it's never too late to like uh, destroy a play. Like You can't say, oh my God, I'm so deep into it that it's too late. No. No, because you're gonna go further, you know. So, um, so, so, yeah. So, anyway, that. Uh, did, are there any questions that popped up, or anything I can? Would he... I have, I have one question from Kelsey, and she wants to know: Are there routines, behaviors, or art that you come back to for inspiration that spark your creativity? One last well, question to end the session. Yeah, there's a really good book called A Giacometti Portrait. It's a very thin book. It takes it's it should take you uh, you know less than half a day to read five hours four hours and it's uh, uh, by James Lord and James Lord was asked by uh, was a friend of Giacometti's and Giacometti said to James Lord, "Hey James, you know can you stay around Paris for for a day or two because I want to do your portrait. It's due at the end of the month or something like that." And, um, and James Lord said, sure. And then Giacometti started. And then, you know, the, the, he, he would start, it wouldn't work. And he'd be like, this is shit. Let me just stop right now. Let's go for coffee. And he would walk away. And then James Lord would look at the paintings like, this is pretty good. And then it would go on. And then it, 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 the next day, and then the next day, suddenly, James Lord finds himself there for like 30 days posing for this, for this uh, painting till it's finally due. And, um, and there's, there's a couple of lessons there, which is like, I, I read that because I understand like what the artistic process is. I understand how much work it is. It's not, it's just like, it's getting there and, and really fighting for it. I also understand that you're never gonna be completely satisfied. Giacometti runs out of time. That's basically what it is. He runs out of time. And we have to figure out ways of, of, of setting up deadlines for ourselves. Um, so we have to say to somebody, hey, I'm going to send you my new play next week. I want you to read it, even if you haven't finished it, because now you have a deadline. And even if it's not working, you, you got to meet that deadline. Um, so it's, it's a good book. In, in, for a variety of reasons, and um, and it's and it's funny because James Lord is sort of trapped there, and the painting sold about like two years ago. It was sold for like a million something. It was, uh, and it's a great painting. It's a Giacometti, um, and you can probably find it, uh, uh, James Lord's um, Giacometti. So the book is readily available. So it's a it's a great one to read. Yeah. Okay. So those are the two books. Anybody who studies with me, those are the two books I have them read is Giacometti Portrait and um, Backwards and Forwards. Those are like, there are two books that I want everybody to read 
as far as playwriting books. One has nothing to do with playwriting and the other one has everything to do with playwriting. Uh, so those are the two books everybody reads, so yeah. And where besides ESPA do you teach, Rohit? I teach at, I, I teach in a few places. I teach it uh, with the graduate students at Columbia. I teach the first mm -hmm. years. And then I teach uh, uh, the BFAs at NYU. And I also teach at Goddard College, which is the low residency one. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's a slightly different way of working, but yeah. So those are the three places I teach. So um, yeah, I teach a lot. I like it. It's fun. Well, we love having you teach for us. We, it is a gift. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, um, yeah. Happy writing and, and enjoy the rest of the day. So um, and enjoy tomorrow. So cool. Thank you, Rogelio. All right. Cheers. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you all for joining us again today for our, our lunch and learn. I got to say, like popping into the rooms um, conversation was on fire today. Uh, and it's really inspiring to hear you all share your work and talk about next steps and like what we can continue to do as a group um, and also on our own time. So thank you for that. Thank you for your suggestions. There were some great suggestions today. So if you have uh, suggestions or ideas, send them my way. You have my email address. Uh, it's Kelly at primarystations.org, just through the Y, Kelly. And uh, we do have a final prompt for you to take away uh, with you. And I'm going to read it out here. And you're also going to receive it uh, written in an email. So the final prompt is, we now want you to take the character that you created and put them into action. Pick one text message that you wrote. Imagine the person that your character sent that message to or received it from, depending on how you did your character sketch. Uh, and then we will call the character you sketched from Rohelio character A and the other character you're using character B. Using Rohelio's method of getting yourself unstuck from writer's block, imagine these two characters are together in a room and write a scene that begins with character B saying to character A, that person you created today, why aren't you talking? Uh, I know there was one breakout room who was talking about uh, using that exercise. So now's your chance. Right here, right now, today, tomorrow, your choice. It's been a pleasure. As always, thank you for joining us. Uh, these Lunch and Learns are a success because of you. So thank, thank you, thank you. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. And I hope the sun comes out. It's very gray here in New York. <laughs> Bye, all.